you. So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our Martini ha Happy Hour um, with John Martini. My name is Helen Hickman. I am the president of the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild and I welcome you to San Francisco, the Bay Area via this computer Zoom go to meeting and all of us members of the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild welcome you to our beautiful city for just the next 90 minutes. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, and you're welcome to actually uh, put um, put any questions you have for John in the in the chat box so i just wanted to let you all know um like i said my name is helen hickman uh i live out here in the richmond district of san francisco where it's nice and beautiful the san francisco tour guide guild is a guild of tour guides here in san francisco in the bay area we've been which is established in 1986 um uh we're for education of guides and educating people around the um the world about our fabulous city and uh we've decided that we want to share our city with everyone um here and um uh, around the world and uh so here we are um I'd like to do the same thing. Keep make sure you're muted. Um, we're going to keep the cameras on. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And if you could say where you're from, uh, it would be great. Uh, and if you're a friend of, of people, we have people here from uh, the Guide Association of New York, the DC Guild. We have friends and families from uh, West Coast to East Coast here. Uh, right now, we have DC, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, Sacramento Bakersfield, we have Las Vegas, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Oakland, Alameda, Berkeley, and many more. Uh, let's see here. Um, so where John is going to be speaking about is a fabulous uh, part of San Francisco that you can see right here on my screensaver, and this is what it looks like now. So for those of you who have not experienced Sutro Bass in San Francisco, you're going to be surprised of what was there, what John is going to share to share with you of the beauty, um, the spectacularness of what was once there in San Francisco. So I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, John Martini. He is also a member of the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild. It has been for many years. Uh, he is a native San Franciscan. Yes, they actually do exist. And um, he is what I like to say a rock star historian out here in San Francisco. Uh, he is a self-proclaimed lifelong historian of studying California history and the American West. He's been uh, was a park ranger at the National Park Service for 25 years, which he was in the Presidio, Forest Point, and Alcatraz, to name three of the places where he was. Um, he's worked as a historical consultant. He specializes in historical preservation uh, and military preservation. He's whoops, He's written many books, one being here, Sutro Bass. Uh, oh, can you see me? Uh, one being here, Sutro, the Sutro uh, Bass, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about today. And um, he has made, he's considered a, 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 a quoted historian of San Francisco history, and it's been in many magazines and TV shows, such as the Discovery Channel. I put his website in the chat if you want to learn a little bit more about John. Uh, you can read a lot about him and, and find out more about his books. And um, also, we're using this as we're offering this to you free. I'm going to put John's PayPal account. If you feel so uh, uh, that you'd like to give John a gratuity as a guide, we are going to put that uh, his PayPal in the thread of the chat. And you'd be more than happy to give him gratuity if you'd like. Uh, so, John, are you ready to take this over? All right. Well, thanks everybody. Welcome to uh, the technical learning curve. My name's John Martini. Uh, as Helen said, I'm, I'm a native of San Francisco. When um, I was growing up, as just a kid out in the uh, Richmond district and out in Westlake, uh, one of the places my mom would take me over and over again, one of my favorite places, was uh, Sutro Baths. Um, although when I was a kid, they, there was no more swimming. It was simply called Sutro's. And what, what went on there? It was this huge 
barn of a building that just seemed to go on forever. And it was like frozen in time. Uh, inside it was, uh, there was an ice skating rink and there were museum exhibits and there were Nickelodeons. Uh, there were stuffed animals. There were telescopes to look out to see it. it and uh, my mom was something of a historian. She told me it went back to the 1890s and they used to be swimming there. But I was just kind of overawed by the scale of the thing. Um, Sutro beds, when it was intact, it was over three acres in size, covered with glass. I didn't know this when I was five, six years old. All I knew is, you know, it was full of not just exhibits and displays, but to a five-year-old, really fascinating, all kinds of painted over windows, uh, locked doors, uh, blocked off hallways. And I was like, what was this place? What went on here? And um, the bads, they, we lost them in 1966 in a pretty spectacular fire we'll talk about. And the site has just been ruins ever since. And I just sort of filed all this away as just part of growing up. And then uh, in the early 1970s, the land where Sutro Baths belonged, it was uh, purchased by the National Park. The National Park. National Park. National Park. National Park. Hello, as uh, open space. And I started to work for the Park Service. And because I had actually been in the building that was now just reduced to ruins, I became something of a subject matter expert, partly just drawing on childhood memories. As time went by, I became more and more proficient in researching the actual history, uh, photographs, the uh, people that were involved, uh, the, the scale of construction. And uh, I retired from the Park Service and they brought me back to write what's called a historic structure report on Sutro Baths. And that's a lot of what I'm gonna share with you as, as we go through. Uh, I titled my book Sutro's Glass Palace because that's really what it was, like a little miniature version of Crystal Palace built at the edge of the, the Western world. There we go. For those of you who don't know San Francisco, uh, we're at the tip of a peninsula, 49 miles square, and the very northwest corner has never been developed, uh, partly because it was so rocky, so windblown, it was pretty much undevelopable. Uh, it was called Point Lobos, uh, but more commonly it was called Land's End, which is a really good description. It's where the land ends. It's the furthest west point of San Francisco, furthest west point of, uh, of the United States. And it, it's been drawing people for hundreds and uh, hundreds of years, well before Europeans got here, Native American peoples used this area. And there at the furthest uh, westmost point, there are the remains in this little valley of uh, the ruins of something intriguing, uh, mysterious, uh, that are known locally as the ruins of Sutro Baths. A lot of people don't know much more beyond that. They don't know really what it was except swimming pools. Well, Sutro's was a lot more than that. What I'm going to do in the next 40 minutes or so is try to give you an overview history of what was once in this cove. What was it like? What was its history? What was its rise and fall? And, and the legacy that still stays with a lot of San Franciscans. The area of Sutro Baths, as I mentioned, was called Land's End. And it's a really rugged area. And it's a place that draws people because of this dramatic rugged meeting of rocks and surf and ocean. And uh, we, we've had meetings and we've talked to people and, and say, you know, what draws you there? And that, well, all we can come up with is there's, you just call it westering, the idea of constantly moving west across America to find a new life. And when you get to San Francisco and when you get to Land's End, that's as west as it gets. And even Native Americans felt this draw and the local tribes people, the Ohlone people who used to live out in the Land's End area, they had a song about life at the edge of the world. And uh, the refrain was, I'm not going to sing in Ohlone, you know, I sing it any language, but the refrain went, I'm dancing, I'm dancing on the brink of the world. And that is the feeling out there. Early in the uh, California's history, as the young United States took over California. 
the gold rush ensued in 1849, 1850, more and more people from all over the world packed into the boom town of San Francisco. And this Land's End area became a destination for people riding horses, uh, wagons, um, or if you wanted to hoof it over several miles of sand dunes and you got to this through this West Point and there's some enterprising people in the early 1860s opened a tavern hanging on a cliff and they called it the Cliff House. It was one of a series of taverns up and down the coast and it became very popular with what was called the, the sporting trade, the uh, people that could afford horses and wagons. Early on, somebody set up a stage line and it cost the equivalent of about $10 each way in today's money, but you could take a stagecoach out there. And what was the attraction? Essentially looking out at the ocean, looking out at those rocks, uh, which were at that time covered with uh, California sea lions, hence the name uh, Seal Rocks. And the Cliff House and the land around it became popular destinations. Just north of the Cliff House was a beautiful little sandy cove it didn't really have a name. It was called variously Seal Rocks Cove, uh, or it was called, uh, sometimes it was called Nyad Cove. Uh, this 1870 oil painting shows it just cute little beach. Uh, if you know the California coast at all, going down between San Francisco and Santa Cruz, there's all kinds of these little calm pocket beaches. This was one of them. And this would become the site of Sutro Baths. Why Sutro? Because of this gent. Adolf Sutro, uh, emigrant from Aachen, Germany, who came to California during the gold rush. And he made his pile of money, not in California, surprisingly, but up in the Comstock silver mines in Nevada. In the late 1860s and 1870s, there was a huge silver boom. Probably more uh, value in silver came out of the Comstock load than came out of the Sierra Nevadas during the uh, earlier California gold rush. Sutro was an engineer. He didn't mine for silver, but he helped a tunneling system that would uh, bring silver ore out of the deep mines, and then it would be refined. Uh, he would uh, charge for people to use his tunnel system. He would charge for using his ore refining plant. He even charged for the water that drained out of what's called the Sutro Tunnel. Uh, everything that uh, he did, he tended to lay the name Sutro on, and uh, the Sutro Tunnel made him quite a pile of money, probably about, well, a million dollars in his days, that equals about maybe $22 million in today's money. He came back to San Francisco, and in 1881, he bought the hilltop directly behind the cliff house and overlooking little Seal Rock Cove, and up there, he built his uh, house. It was called Sutro's Heights and Sutro's Gardens. Uh, again, this refrain, everything's being called Sutro. Uh, the guy's ego was, was large. And Sutro made his house up there, and he set out on a real estate buying spree. Adolf Sutro, at one point, owned one-twelfth of San Francisco. He pretty much bought up what were considered to be undevelopable uh, wilderness lands and sand dunes, which compromised a lot of the peninsula of San Francisco. He'd vegetate them and he'd uh, uh, essentially he'd flip them. And his fortune grew and grew and grew. And at the heights, he landscaped them like uh, something out of an English garden filtered through uh, California realities. A lot of drought tolerant uh, plantings were put out there. And it was a public destination. He invited people to come. He encouraged people to come, partly because he was that old line school of uh, nouveau riche where you wanted to do something. And he'd come from working class roots. He wanted to do something for the working class folks of San Francisco. So he opened his heights. He opened them to visitors. Uh, they became famous around the world, a, a color illustration from the early 1880s. And Sutra wanted to do more. He wanted not just to have a restaurant. He bought the Cliff House. Uh, he had his gardens. He would develop the area around Land's End into a seaside recreation destination unlike anything else that was in San Francisco. So quick timetable is he got here during the gold rush in 1850. He's wealthy by 1881, settles at the Heights. He buys the Cliff House. 
And then he took his sights on uh, getting people to come out. He said the sporting trade, you had to rent a carriage or pay big money for the stage to get to the cliff house. Sutro underwrote constructing a steam train line. And Sutro's steam train line, it offered a nickel fare uh, with transfers from any place in San Francisco. So now the working class could come out and the whole area of Sutro's Heights, the gardens, the cliff house became generically known to work in San Franciscans as the cliff and go into San Francisco on a weekend, the common destination, read this in the old time newspapers all the time, the crowds were heading for the cliff. They were crowding the steam train cars, heading for the cliff, thousands and thousands of people. And Sutro took a look at that little cove, uh, Nyad Cove, Seal Rock Cove, and uh, that point there, it's called Point Lobos. He owned that land and the area around it, it was covered with tide pools. The family story is that Adolf used to like to hike around there and he was intrigued by how tide pools filled at high tide with the uh, water, wave water rushing in. And as the tides went out, the waves slacked off and tide pools uh, would form. And in them would be sea anemones and small fish and crabs. He was not a biologist, but he was fascinated by the hydraulics and by the sea life. And this is very Victorian thinking, very much engineer thinking. He thought, well, I can do better. And his idea was to take this whole cove and turn it into a giant tide pool and swimming complex. And uh, this aerial view, here's, um, here's what the thought was. At the very top, on the left says, see fishing rock? That's a that's a landmark still there. We're going to see it in a lot of these photos. And to the right, it says aquarium. And below that, swimming pond. This is a his embryonic idea for Sutro baths. And that was have an aquarium that would be filled by the waves at high tide. And uh, in there, he'd stock it with fish. Or uh, he, he actually said in interviews that he thought that sea lions would be thrown into it by the waves. Sea lions don't do that but like i said he wasn't a marine biologist and also turned the uh rest of the cove flooded with seawater making a swimming pond uh and thing is he actually did it and this was just the jumping off point he had even bigger plans uh, in the late 1880s one of the first things that he did was he had his workers blast out a basin almost like a giant bathtub at 75 feet by 35 feet uh, just above the breakers so at high tide, like in this photo, breakers would wash into it. They'd fill the basin with uh, water. Every time the waves broke, it filled to the brim and the water had to go somewhere. He had his workers dig a 150 foot long tunnel through the rocks and the uh, water would rush just via gravity through the uh, tunnels. And there was a floodgate that could be open to allow the water to flow in. And in this old illustration, you can see at the at the left, the semicircle, that was the aquarium. And the amazing thing is, is, is this thing worked. Uh, he demonstrated it many times. Uh, he brought reporters out. The waves would fill the catch basin. The uh, water would rush through the tunnel. It would fill the aquarium. And then it would be uh, allowed to drain out. And the way it was designed was that there were stairs carved into the bowl. It was about 12 foot deep. And you could walk around inside and look at the fish and the crabs and the seashells. I haven't read anywhere that any fish or seashells or crabs were ever in there. Definitely no seals or sea lions. It just worked hydraulically. But again, um, this was this was the start. And his aquarium, well, let me, let's take it from another position. This is uh, on the hill looking down. At the upper right, you can see there's the aquarium. And it looks like a stagnant pond in front of you. This was this was the start of what he called his swimming pond. So the, uh, you could go to the aquarium, and then you could go for a dip. Uh, saltwater bathing was very big in the 1890s. It was thought to have therapeutic properties far and above just uh, swimming, which is it's good for you. But saltwater bathing was very popular. Uh, it was dangerous, though, in the Pacific Ocean. So the idea is that the water that came out of the aquarium, it filled the swimming pond behind a seawall. 
that rock wall there and uh, uh, running from uh, right to left, it was piled boulders that he quarried out of the hills and it kept sinking into the sand. He had to build that uh, rubble wall three times before it stabilized enough for the pond to start to form. In an aerial view, we had an uh, artist recreate what it looked like in those days. So idea number one, this is what Sutra's first vision at the aquarium at upper left, it uh, circular, it wasn't a perfect circle at all. Uh, then to the right is the swimming pond. And when it did fill, it pretty much filled uh, that brim to that basin to the brim. Not a lot of records of people swimming in it because there was no physical development like bathhouses or changing rooms or anything like that. Uh, it's still working hydraulically though. And Sutro realized pretty early on, he had to make it a little bit more formal to attract people. So this is 1889, two years later, it evolved into this. He had lined the cove with concrete and subdivided it into what they called swimming tanks, swimming pools. There were uh, six different pools of various sizes. The biggest one was that one that was built like a, an L, and that was, that was bigger than a football field. The smaller swimming pools, they were heated to various temperatures. And you see there was a powerhouse, and the powerhouse, uh, it was both, uh, it both heated the water and it also, it was a laundry. Uh, still, you, you're missing something. You, where, where do you change? You know, where, where do you pay admission? Um, when it reached this point, Sutro is touting how his Sutro baths are going to be open for business. And it's like a moving date. First 1892, then 1893, and then finally 1894, he finally let people in. And he's uh, touting to the people who are uh, giving tours to, always, always journalists, he loved to give tours. He said that, uh, I'm, I'm uh, not done yet. When we're done, we're gonna cover the thing with a glass roof so that uh, uh, sun filtering through will, will warm the water. Um, I created a graphic to show how the pools were filled. There were no pumps to pump water into these various tanks. It worked via hydraulics, uh, water rushing from one level to another. At lower left, where I put a blue drop of water, that's water, seawater, that came from the catch basin, and it rolled through a tunnel, and then it went into, it's a settling pond, that's the old aquarium, and then, by gravity, it ran through a series of channels and it could be diverted into any of the swimming pools that was wanted. What they had, Sutra would have his engineers do is he would mix hot water coming out of the boiler house with cold seawater, and the tanks would be various temperatures. Tank number one was generally unheated seawater. Out here, that's anywhere from like 57 to 62 degrees. Uh, that's cold. Uh, the other tanks were different temperatures. The warmest tank was about 90 degrees. It's changing shape a bit. It used to be just a rubble wall. Now you can see the swimming pools have taken effect. In fact, some of these uh, construction is underway. Some of the tanks are full of water. Now there's the aquarium in back. They became a settling pond, the powerhouse. What's going on on the right is they're building bleachers so that people can sit outside and watch activities going on in the swimming pools. Sutro was a brilliant man. He was probably Mensa level intelligent. And he was also, I think, ADD because he kept getting distracted. He would, he would go on trips to Europe. He would buy books. He would buy a statuary. He'd buy uh, other uh, real estate investments, but he'd keep coming to, back to the baths and then giving change orders to his architects. And one order that he finally came up with was, we're going to cover the thing in glass. In fact, we're going to actually, we're going to sidewall it. We're going to make it a giant enclosed building. He had two architects who he probably drove to distraction. And uh, they had a design competition and a fellow named of Kali and Lemmy came up with the idea for how to enclose the swimming pools in glass. Remember, the swimming pools already existed. The waterworks, the powerhouse, it was all there. Finally, at that point, he brought in an architect to design a building to fit on top of it. Sort of like if your crazy next door neighbor built a big foundation in his backyard uh, you know, by himself, 
without an architect. And then when the foundation was done, then he called an architect in to, to finish it for him. Cost money, but they did it. Uh, construction went on for three years. Uh, steel support beams, wood trusses for the roof. We were out here in California and there wasn't a lot of big steel. It all had to be imported. So a huge amount of the sutra baths were constructed of wood. An army of laborers worked on the baths. Uh, people were always coming, what is Sutro doing out there? Uh, we know it's gonna be called the baths, but what is it? What's it going to be like? Uh, and Sutro was always going, but oh, we're gonna have a grand opening in 1892, 1893. Uh, he was a visitor to the site. Being an engineer, he was very much hands-on. Uh, one thing that he was always very concerned about were uh, the finishes, uh, the colors, and uh, that it would be affordable. Uh, he never, uh, something I learned in my research, he never intended to be a, a swimming pool manager. He was hoping he'd build it and then be able to lease it out to somebody else to run. He didn't want to be involved in the minutia. By uh, late 1894, this is what the building looked like from the outside. It was a series of uh, arched roofs that covered the six swimming tanks. In the distance, on top of the hill, you see the little uh, uh, lookout tower? That, that was uh, where Sutro's house was. So he had a panoramic view of everything going on beyond uh, beneath him. Uh, inside the building, it was just vast. Uh, what I always try to tell people is that when this was happening in the early 1890s, uh, this was still the Wild West. Uh, the only way to get here from the East Coast of the United States was either take an, an endless train trip across the United States or take a sailing ship around Cape Horn. There were no roads. Uh, there was uh, no uh, super highways, no airplanes, of course. And Part of what Adolf Sutro was doing was saying, we are the queen city of the Pacific coast, San Francisco. We are civilized. Look what we can do out here. This was probably the biggest building uh, west of the Mississippi, maybe with the exception of the original Mormon tabernacle in Salt Lake City. Uh, but it was uh, huge in scale. You can see the people standing there. Uh, if way in the distance, there's actually, there's an arch you could, uh, under an enlargement till there's little tiny people there with musical instruments, a band trying to fill this place with music. And this is what Sutro kind of got the engineering design from. This is an 1860s railroad station. Uh, I believe this is Waterloo Station in London. The technology that Sutro was employing to construct the baths wasn't unique or cutting edge. What it was is he was adapting what already existed, but he was doing it instead of uh, iron and steel, he was doing it with wood out here on the Pacific coast. Uh, Got to give you get some nuts and bolts. I try not to overwhelm people with minutia, but the baths was uh, three and a half acres of glass, three million feet of lumber, 500 feet by 255 feet, and uh, enough room for, I don't know how they calculated this level, 1,628 bathers, and there were 517 dressing rooms. The laundry could handle 20,000 suits every day. If you were to take the roof off the baths, you can see how it was kind of nestled into the natural little bowl shape of that cove of Nyad Beach. Uh, we're looking from the west to the east, and the pools are at the bottom. Uh, bleachers. There were bleacher seating for about uh, 2,500 people so that they could sit there and they could watch swimming competitions. They would have actually mock, uh, almost like used to flood the Coliseum apparently and have mock sea battles in there. Sutro did the same thing. You know, rowboats dressed up to look like warships, uh, people battling each other with paddles from what I've read. The bleacher seats also filled up with people who just come to Sutro Baths just to watch the activities. Not everybody that came there was a swimmer. They were coming because it was a destination. The At the very top, there's a big glass uh, dome-ish structure with two little turrets on it. That was the grand entrance that actually was never used. 
Sutro kept changing his mind. One idea was that there would be a grand entrance for uh, people arriving by carriage. Instead, people uh, entered the very upper right, that little square building, it's called a Greek temple, because people weren't coming by carriage, as it turned out. People would come to Sutro Baths by the thousands, by foot, on steam trains and later streetcars. Now, swimming was the big draw of the baths. It was a palace for the people, a place where you could recreate. And there wasn't just swimming, there were also uh, workout rooms, uh, there were saunas, there were uh, club rooms, where groups like the Olympic Club, uh, the San Francisco uh, Fire Department, San Francisco Police Department, they had their own private club rooms, as they were called, their own lockers, their own shower rooms. Uh, and as they got closer to opening Sutro Baths in 1894, Sutro, he went to war with a very powerful group in California, the Southern Pacific Railroad. Earlier, I showed you a picture of the steam train that Sutro had helped underwrite. Well, it was purchased by the Southern Pacific Railroad. And in 1894, as the baths are nearing completion, the Southern Pacific, which was a pretty heartless monopoly, they doubled the fare. So it went from five cents to 10 cents each way. Uh, that was a huge imposition for the people that Sutro wanted to have to come out to Sutro Baths. So he did a very odd thing. Uh, he opened Sutro Baths, but no one was allowed to go swimming for a year and a half, Sutro Baths was open to the public, and they had band concerts, they had uh, vaudeville acts, they had, uh, his museum was uh, filled with stuffed animals and replica artworks, but no one could go swimming. He said, I'm, that no one swims until Southern Pacific Railroad drops the fare back to a nickel. And believe it or not, eventually the railroad capitulated to Adolf Sutro, and the steam train fare went back to five cents. Uh, the, when I was researching Sutros, I kept coming across this weird thing, and there were two grand opening dates. One was fall of 1894, and the other was a spring of 1896. How could it have two openings? Well, it turns out the fall 1894 was the soft opening when this picture was taken. You know, there's no one in the water. And uh, finally, in March 1896, that's when they had the grand dedication, the grand opening. It was actually kind of anticlimactic, but finally people they were allowed to go swimming. If you went to Sutro Baths, you got a program of what was going to be happening that day. And if you look at the one on the left, mammoth opening of the swimming season, 1897, uh, vaudeville acts, uh, valuable prizes, uh, something, something called the Charles Cavill, the world-famous swimmer in his Monte Cristo act, Charles Cavill was uh, typical of a lot of the entertainment they had there. But in his case, his hook was that he was not only a world champion swimmer, he was an escape artist. And he would be uh, uh, chained up, uh, sort of a predecessor to Harry Houdini. He'd be chained up and he would be thrown into one of the pools and he would you know, disappear into the green water of the baths in the deepest part of the deepest pool and the, some bubbles would come to the surface and then nothing. And the crowd would be watching and they'd be, uh, some would be counting off the time that he was down. And he got to about a minute and people started to, to murmur, you know, is everything okay? And was gonna, he got to two minutes and people were starting to yell, you know, to the lifeguards, go get him, something's wrong. This He got to three minutes and women are like, you know, passing out uh, from, uh, from, the vapors. And finally, after like almost four minutes or so, he would come bursting to the surface, you know, <gasps> huge, and the crowd would just erupt in a huge applause. And his secret came out later is uh, he had a big wash tub, the outside of which was painted the same color as the bottom of the swimming pools, and he had it inverted and there was an air bubble down there. So Charlie dove in, came up in the uh, upside down wash tub, and he just hung out there for a couple of minutes, and then he came to the surface again. Now, this all went south when he took the act on the road, and he went down to a newly opened uh, swimming pool. I think I think it was in Stockton, California. And it turned out that they weren't using seawater. They weren't using fresh water. They were using mineral water in those swimming pools. And when he uh, put his tub down, and he dove in, and took the handcuffs off and went up to, to the air pocket. 
it was a, I guess it was anaerobic air. There was no real oxygen in it. And he passed out and he drowned. And the, the hideous part of the story is that the lifeguards knew something was wrong. And they went in, they pulled him out and they had him outside of the pool and they were giving him artificial respiration. And the crowds were cheering, thinking it was part of the act. Um, well, Charlie died. This is May Day, 1897. What happens on May Day? A bunch of little girls dance around maypoles and it drew a crowd, according to the newspapers, of 9,000 people in this photo. Uh, it's, the roof is packed. I, you know, entertainment is, uh, guess where you find it? Maypoles in action. That picture showing uh, 9,000 people filling the place to the rafters, the actually rated capacity for the building was 20,000 people. Uh, the, and the former safety officer in me, I, I just, I can't fathom how you could get 20,000 people into that building and safely get them out if there was a fire or an emergency. It wasn't just swimming and maypole dances. Sutro liked to buy, his words, bric-a-brac on his travels. And the bric-a-brac ran the gamut from replicas of, of, of fine art to uh, eth ethnographic items. And this picture here, you can see on the right, I think it's a, a giant snowshoe. On the left, a polar bear. There were cases and cases of exhibits like this. Here's one on what's called the Grand Promenade. The case on the right, it has, uh, it has a tiger in it. It has a leopard and it has uh, a kit box and uh, there's a couple of house cats and we're guessing that the theme of this taxidermy was uh, kitty cats uh, other places there was a bear fighting a stuffed python there were stuffed sea lions he considered this to be you know just of interest and educational it wasn't supposed to be a curated exhibit like we have today it was stuffed the old cabinet of curiosities and one of the most popular things he had was he purchased egyptian artifacts uh, and whoever advised him when he purchased these uh, per, uh, advised him very very well the one on the left is a, a triple sarcophagus mummy it was apparently a priest at uh, one of the temples I, uh, Abu Simbel, but together with what's called the yellow mummy on the right and a third one and a whole collection of dismembered mummy parts that became later on the core of the museum exhibit collection now at San Francisco State University out at the State, the State University campus. Uh, these were not sold when the sutros closed down. The heirs to the Sutro made sure that these went to uh, institution of higher learning. People always want to talk about swimming and the swimsuits. Is the 1890s, or in this case, 1906, a couple of years after the grand opening? Women and men, they were both required to wear Sutro baths issued wool swimsuits. You didn't have your own swimsuit in those days. I mean, it just wasn't a luxury. Most people, you know, little opportunity to use a swimsuit. So they didn't keep one in their closet. So you went to Sutro Baths and uh, you rented them. It cost 10 cents to get into Sutros. If you wanted to go swimming, you rent a swimsuit uh, and a towel and get a locker room key. It cost an extra 15 cents, 25 cents. Partially, this was done also for uh, health reasons you couldn't be sure what people might have been bringing in to go swimming that yeah you wanted some control god knows they'd be swimming in their long underwear Ugh. what was sanitation like so they had several thousand swimsuits that were laundered every time they were used and you were issued a cleanly laundered swimsuit and a couple of towels uh, trivia bit that i turned up was that although these things were laundered they didn't use soap when they cleaned them they were wool and they were afraid that the detergents of the day would destroy the wool after just a few washings so these things were put through a boiling hot tubs of seawater and after going through the boiling seawater then they were let to uh, dry in a dry room with temperatures over 200 degrees i guess that sanitized them but it, 
personally, I would have liked to have seen a little soap used occasionally. The swimsuits were required where up through the 1920s. Um, kept seeing photos like this, and I thought, you know, holy medals? Is it everybody Catholic? And turns out what those medals are around their necks, those were tags for the locker rooms. When you went to Sutro's and you got your uh, suit and you got your towels, you got a tag for a locker room. He showed it to the attendant. He walked you to an individual room about the size of a walk-in closet, went inside, changed, came out, and he locked the door behind you. And there's your tag. Show it to him when you come back. He walks you to him, lets you in again. That was the process. 1897, uh, Sutro's is at its height. Uh, Sutro Baths opened in 1896. Uh, a uh, month after the baths opened, Sutro opened the Cliff House. This is the one that attracts everybody's attention. It was only in existence from 1896 to 1907, called the Gingerbread Cliff House. It was uh, Sutro's idea. Um, he came back from his travels, and it's a mixture of German and French chateau architecture. I'd say it's something like, like Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria would have designed. And if that wasn't enough, uh, remember Sutro had uh, gotten into an argument with the uh, old railroad company about getting people out and how the railroad company had jacked the price to 10 cents and then back to a nickel. Well, Sutro was so upset at having to have put up with this battle with the railroad company, he decided he'd build his own railroad company. So the same month that Sutro Baths opened, and the cliff house in the background opens, he opens the Sutro Electric Railroad Company, which are not railroad, it's an electric uh, streetcar. Cutting edge, state of the art, clean, and it brought passengers literally at the front door to Sutro Baths, all owned by Adolf. Oh, on the left, uh, there's a Ferris wheel. Sutro even had an outdoor midway. Uh, basically a bunch of recycled rides and attractions from a just closed World's Fair that had been held in Golden Gate Park. Sutro bought up the Midway at a garage sale price. He set it up and uh, ta-da, the bath, the heights, the cliff, it's finished. And uh, personal tragedy, Sutro suffers a stroke. And he spends most of 1897 and 1898 living in seclusion up at Sutro Heights, there in the fog in the distance, uh, very private. Uh, he apparently was suffering only from a stroke, but from dementia and uh, diabetes, and he dies August the 8th, 1898. The woman who steps in to take over his incredibly expansive and complex estate is uh, his daughter, Emma, Emma Sutro Merritt, and uh, she opens the books, and according to what other historians have discovered. When uh, she started to take control of everything, they she found that uh, at the time of her dad's death, there was only about $1,000 liquid in the estate. It was worth millions, but it was all real estate holdings uh, in San Francisco and Nevada, uh, Napa and Sonoma counties, uh, buildings in downtown San Francisco. The, ba the baths had cost a million dollars and 1896 dollars to build. Uh, the Cliff House, uh, all of these things. And the revenue income was not anywhere matching what the outflow was. But I haven't even talked about the mortgages on all these properties. Uh, Sutro lived large and he liked to share, and somebody had to bring things back to reality, and that was Emma. Uh, Emma started to do things like she uh, sold off the streetcar company, she shut down the midway, uh, she uh, cut back on the staff at the baths, started to sell off uh, other properties, and uh, he got an appraisal done on the estate. And uh, Sutra had, to, he had six kids. And as you can imagine, there was a huge kerfuffle over who was gonna get what, and everybody was accusing everybody else of uh, misfeasance with the money. Um, it took years to sort out. It wasn't until after 1910 that they came to a successful settlement of the estate. One thing that they couldn't do and they couldn't sell and they couldn't uh, get the city of San Francisco to do was take over the baths. Uh, nobody wanted them. Uh, 
they were so large and so expensive to run that uh, Emma tried twice to get the city of San Francisco to buy them on a, on a bond issue. Again, the city appraiser took one look at the building and the official position was do not vote for this bond issue. This is going to be a white elephant. So twice that didn't work. And uh, they uh, once tried to sell it at auction. That didn't work. That's when this pamphlet here, this was published uh, on the eve of uh, one of the auctions. It's basically, it was a real estate pro promo piece. And inside it had photographs of happy swimmers and all the activities going on. What they didn't show you was the inside of the place on a weekday when uh, you could fire a cannon through it and, and, and not hit anybody. It was a destination on weekends. It was a destination on days when um, you had uh, conventions in town, or in this case, they had swimming competitions. But most of the time, it was pretty quiet and expensive to run. I've seen a lot of the maintenance reports. The roof leaked. Uh, waves crashing against the west wall would smash the windows. Uh, they, uh, at its height, they had like 60 employees, everything from boilermen to two taxidermists. Well, Emma cut that back down to size. They couldn't unload the baths and the Sutro estate, after Emma's uh, death, uh, Sutro's grandson would manage it. The Sutro family reluctantly held on to the place through the uh, early 1950s. The 1910s and 20s were pretty uh, miserable time out there at the baths. Uh, lonely artifacts like the ferris wheel left over from sutro's windmill just sitting by itself out in the sand dunes so it was you know knocked down as a hazard in 1912. an aerial photograph taken sometime in the 20s this was really a, a hard time what was going on was not only um, the baths losing some of their popularity but also too it was the onset of uh, prohibition and at the very bottom down there, that little white building, that's the last iteration of the Cliff House, the one that's still there. Well, when prohibition uh, was put in, the Volstead Act was the law that enforced prohibition. The Cliff House lost a huge amount of its revenue. Virtually every restaurant that serves uh, liquor, wine, or alcohol is a huge profit maker. Once you cut out the alcohol uh, sales, the Cliff House only soldiered on for a couple of years, and then it shuttered in 1922. Uh, Sutro Baths suffered because there, the, a lot of the crowds that were coming to the Cliff House weren't coming to go to the Cliff House, and the result, they weren't going to the baths. So the uh, by 1930, the Sutro family had sort of a hard choice to make. Are we going to keep running the baths, or are we uh, going to demolish them? What are we going to do? And it was a Sutro's grandson who decided that managing the estate, he would reinvent the baths. And they did. They turned it into sort of a nouveau jazz age uh, destination for San Francisco, it's trying to attract a new age group uh, to bring the crowds back. And this became the, their sort of their uh, thematic, the, the diving girl in the one piece uh, Jansen suit. And you have not seen San Francisco if you have not seen Sutra Baths and Museum. And it wasn't just a rethinking of the baths and promo literature. It was also a physical rethinking of the building itself. This is the uh, street entrance in Adolph's day, and this is how it was reimagined in the 1930s. A brilliant Art Deco polychrome colors, uh, sutrotropic beach, and baths, and inside, oh yes, uh, bathing girls. What they were saying in this press photo is uh, essentially read between the lines. This is not your grandfather's sutro baths. Now, the old wool suits were gone. You can now bring your own bathing suits. In the background, you can see ads for the uh, indoor kitty play beach. Literally, they filled one of the swimming pools with sand. They uh, also had the silver slide. That was, um, it was, it was a water slide, new for the 30s. And the crowd started to come back. They rebuilt some of the swimming pools. They uh, modernized them. But they built a swimming tank. There had been no, excuse me, a diving tank. There had been no diving tank before. And the newspapers are full of stories of people cracking their heads on the bottom and suing the Sutro estate, um, tort claims, uh, safety problems. So they built a diving tank with water 17 feet deep. 
that solved that problem. And uh, one thing that they tried, didn't work out quite so well, is they took one of the pools, they drained part of it, and they turned it into sort of like a tiki bar with these weird palm frond thatched little houses and uh, vines going up the columns, old parachutes draped from the rafters, we think to simulate clouds floating overhead, Japanese uh, lanterns. It didn't work. It was called the Tropic Beach, and it was supposed to replicate an indoor Polynesian beach. Well, it, it was it had the ambiance, one person said, of going to a party in a drained swimming pool, which it was. And after only two years, they admitted defeat. They said, this ain't working. And they hit on another idea. This is the exact same view taken four years later. They covered over the tropic beach. They turned it into an ice rink. And that wall on the left with the painted backdrop and the sort of the Swiss chalet, that was just a thin plywood wall. On the other side of that are the heated swimming tanks and the volleyball courts, uh, the baths. So you had ice skating, heated saltwater baths, and occasionally, my mom remembers, indoor fog. Unintentional byproduct, but very real. World War II years were very good for uh, the baths. Lots of sailors, soldiers, Marines were in town. The sutras did, didn't serve alcohol inside. There were plenty of restaurants nearby, but they didn't serve alcohol. So what happens is uh, it's a family-friendly, uh, alcohol-free destination. They welcome service people. Following the war, when these pictures were taken, probably about 1949, it's the first time we get a really good glimpse of the in, of the colors. Everything from the dark green water, remembering Charlie Cavill and his upside down wash tub at the bottom of the deep end blending in. It's one reason that he couldn't be seen down there. Uh, yellow and blue trim, people in contemporary bathing suits. But the place was aging. Uh, the baths were, they were sad, they were old, they were not attracting the crowds that they were anymore. And I like to tell people, especially if you folks uh, know the San Francisco area, if it's going to be a beautiful uh, weekend like we just experienced, and you've got the whole Bay Area at your fingertips, you go, what shall we do with the family this weekend? Shall we drive down to Santa Cruz? Shall we go to the Russian River? Should we go to Tahoe or should we go to Sutro Baths? and the old 1890s swimming tanks. It was kind of a no-brainer. In a modern economy, they uh, people were going elsewhere. And once again, it looked like the baths were gonna have to shut down. And in fact, this time they announced a closing date. The uh, Sutro estate said they were going to close on uh, October 1st, 1952. And literally a couple of days before they were gonna lock the doors, this guy comes forward. This is, this is George Whitney. George Whitney and his brother, Leo, they were the Whitneys who owned Playland at the Beach and uh, Muzi Mechanique, and they owned the Cliff House. And uh, this guy was called uh, the P.T. Barnum of the West Coast. He owned a huge entertainment complex, and he and the Sutros had been friendly rivals for years. I don't think people really knew the difference between what was Whitney's and what was Sutro's. It was all just the same destinations out there at the beach. It's where you went for the day. Well, George Whitney purchased Sutro Baths, and he decided to once again reinvent it, as had been done in the early 30s and the early 50s. George Whitney took the Sutro Baths, the Art Deco look, and he reskinned it in mid-century modern redwood. And uh, he's, now the theme of the place isn't a jazz age uh, destination, it's sort of a gay 90s retro site. They decided, I guess, rather than modernize a lot of the inside, they just cap on the fact that it was, as, remember the term I used earlier, kind of frozen in time. And after only a, a few uh, months, they, they just closed the pools, to be frank, the pools were, uh, losing money, they were hard to maintain, and uh, for trivia, the last day of uh, uh, swimming at Sutro Baths was uh, New Year's Eve of 1953. From 1954 on, no swimming. That's why my memories, I was born in 51, are all of 
ice skating rinks. And the ice skating was really, uh, that became the bread and butter. Uh, professional skaters would work out in the mornings. Ice hockey teams would uh, practice there. They would sometimes have uh, shows like the Ice Follies, uh, exhibition games of ice hockey. It it really wasn't to built a regulation though, so it wasn't really like a, a big venue, but it was extremely popular, just a recreational destination. Ice skating used to be huge in San Francisco. There were at least four major rinks and people had their loyalties. Some people went to Legs Ice Rink and other people went to the 48th Avenue Rink, but dedicated skaters at, at Sutro's. Color picture on the left, the ice rink, if you notice it, the ice rink yeah, in shade. And there was a reason for that. There was three acres of glass. Well, glass and uh, ice and sunlight don't mix. So they actually painted over the, the historic glass that was over the ice skating rink so that it wouldn't melt the ice. Well, the, the great hazards for the skaters. On the right are the uh, old abandoned bleachers, go back to the 1890s. And this is a picture of Zamboni number, well, can't make out the number. Zambonis, everybody knows now, you go to an ice rink, go to hockey, out comes the Zamboni and cleans up the ice uh, at halftime. Well, Sutro bought, a, uh, the Sutro State bought a very early Zamboni and they uh, look closely, it's actually an army jeep with the ice skimming on top of it. Um, I find the technology fascinating. Just like Adolf Sutro brought in his collections, the Whitney's, they brought in theirs. In fact, most of the Sutro stuff went to the dumps. Most of the Sutro stuff brought in by Adolf in the 1890s had seen better days. There's pictures of dump trucks hauling off loads of stuffed animals. Um, there were, uh, oh gosh, there, there was actually a pollution problem with, um, the stuffing and some of the uh, stuffed animals because they used to use arsenic as a material for uh, preserving the specimens. A lot of that stuff went away and the Whitney's brought in their own collections. And in uh, this case, uh, George Whitney Jr. was fascinated by rickshaws. In the background, you can see spinning wheels, buggies, Pictures, historic photographs, the Whitney's got their start in the photography business doing tintype photos. So they had bought a huge collection of Sutro photographs. And some stuff was just almost so bizarre uh, to be memorable. This was the Lord's Last Supper uh, done in waxworks. That one too was in Sutro baths. Uh, Sutro, uh, Whitney's son described his dad as a collector of collections and the baths which he called the old barn. He said it was the perfect place for his dad to display his collections. And one of the things that his dad was also fascinated by were these mechanical, put a dime in and watch the uh, diorama come to life museum exhibits, the Musée Mécanique. And the Musée Mécanique was dozens and dozens of machines, uh, including stereo viewers and uh, melodians, uh, self-contained music boxes and self-contained orchestras, animated dioramas. Some were at Playland at the beach, some were at the Cliff House, some were inside Sutro Baths. In the 50s, in an attempt to keep current and keep doing things that would bring people out to the baths, the Whitney's constructed what was called the Sky Tram. And the Sky Tram was an elevated uh, it looks sort of like, one person said it looks like a, an Art Deco toaster. Uh, it seated 20 people, and at a terrifically slow crawl, uh, it made the run from the Cliff House to Point Lobos, suspended about uh, 75, 80 feet above the beach, and carried passengers over, and then it carried them back. And uh, when you rode the Sky Tram, and you ended up at the, the lower picture at the little depot on Point Lobos, you discover there was nothing to do except wait for it to come back in 15 minutes and ride it back the other way. The Sky Tram somehow it soldiered on for 10 years from 1955 to 1965 and then like so many other attractions it just sort of went away. 
when I was a kid and we went ice skating, we heard stories that there was parts of the building that they didn't allow the public in anymore. And there was a fire door, we shortly discovered. And if you push that fire door open, it was on the ice skating rink. If you push the fire door open, this is what you saw. You saw the blocked off fully two thirds of Sutro Baths, which the public was no longer admitted. These were the old swimming tanks, hadn't been used since 1953. And we were fascinated by it. You know, what's back there? A color photo. In the mid 1960s, when the Sutros was on its last legs, we would uh, go out to Land's End and we'd walk through the fence around the Sutro baths and we'd get around the backside. And this is what happened when you looked in through the broken windows that were on the ocean side. Uh, this is as far as I ever got. Uh, my buddies, would go inside and I'd be standing lookout and they'd be in there and I'd hear them running around and, and saying, hey, Martini, you should see that you're really missing something. And I'm standing outside and I'm going, we're gonna get in trouble. And that was that was my role. I never got to see the inside. I always, you know, don't live with regrets, but I regret that one. 1966. Actually, if you look in the upper left, you can see Sutro Bez, February 6th, 1966. That was the last day of operations. Somebody took these pictures and labeled them for posterity. The baths had just played themselves out. George Whitney, uh, who had seen the overhaul of the baths in the 50s, he'd passed away. His estate was trying to run the place. Again, they're running into the same thing as everything else. It just cost so much to run the place. You couldn't keep them going. And there had been you know, stories they were going to close Sutro's, but you, you never, they're not going to close a landmark. That's this place. It's too historic. Well, March 1st, 1966, the this, this story ran in the San Francisco Examiner about the closing of Sutro Baths. And what were the plans? It was, um, it was not pretty. The whole building was to be demolished. Uh, they were going to turn it into a, a seaside enclave of high-end condominiums. Someone went out there a couple of days after that examiner article and they took a picture. This is the last uh, picture that I can find where there were still exhibits inside Sutros. Everything that was in here, you can see cases of stuffed birds and the, the buggies and in the distance down there, display cases, all this would be hauled out. And in May of uh, 1966, they began demolition to make way for Cliff House properties. There's the Cliff House at lower right, re-envisioned, condominiums lining the cove, high-rise towers at the tips of Point Lobos. Another proposal for the site, if that building, that single high-rise looks familiar, it's uh, very similar to the Fontana apartments that were built above Aquatic Park at the same time and it was by the same developer. Luckily, this didn't happen, but it was planned. Uh, beginning in uh, March and April, May, in May began the demolition. And uh, this is kind of a sad sequence for those of us that knew the building. There's the old grand entrance coming down and gone. To me, it was kind of scary watching the, the news footage of this on television, like how quick a landmark could just go away. And it did. The building was in the process of uh, being demolished when on June 26, 1966, a very convenient fire broke out. And the fire burned through the building with a vengeance. The interior walls had been partly removed. Uh, they had taken everything of value out of the building. A fire started mysteriously. Later on, it, they learned it was 99% arson. And the winds just blew through the building and in one long afternoon, it was gone. After that, the baths took on the appearance that we have now. The company, the insurance company paid to have the site cleaned up, sort of. They removed the broken debris. They removed the old skeletal remains of the iron columns and the maze of uh, pipes and electrical, and it waited for the developers. The developers and their pretty pictures 
ran into two things. One, no one was really interested in funding this project. It's one reason we have all these variations of the artist conceptions. They kept repackaging it, trying to get foreign investors interested. It didn't happen. One firm would sell the land to another firm until finally uh, the last developers were running into the problem of what was called the Coastal Commission, getting permits to do a development this big right on the coast. Uh, the conservation movement helped to save the bad site. And finally, in 1980, the land was purchased by the National Park Service for open space. Uh, nuts and bolts, the National Park Service 1980 paid $5.5 million for the site of the ruins and the hills surrounding it. And we decided that, you know, what are we going to do with it? Well, let's have some public meetings. And what the public said over and over again, when we'd ask them, how would you like to see this area preserved, interpreted, restored? You know, you tell us. We heard, don't ruin the ruins. People love to go there. They love to explore. They love the edginess of the place. And essentially, that's been the Park Service policy ever since. Um, preserve it in situ without doing any major developments. Every time we've tried to do things like you know, put up a walkway or barricades, they don't last. People tear them down. People like the edginess of the place. I think that probably more people go to Sutro's, the ruins, every day now than visited it uh, on an average weekend at the height of its popularity early in the 20th century. People are drawn by the, the curiosity. You know, what, it, what, what was this place all about? What are these things? And you listen to people, and they're trying to figure out the building. That's one reason that uh, I wrote the book, uh, Sutro's Glass Palace, to help explain the building and what it looked like, how it evolved. Oh, and there's really curious features. There's tunnels that run through the point of land, waves crashing and sea mist filling. It's like a movie set. And little trace remains that always fascinated me when I went down there into the ruins after the building was cleared. A set of stairs carved into the natural rock of uh, Land's End. What was this about? And sometimes we get unique attractions showing up. This is a little guy, uh, a river otter that was a uh, christened Sutro Sam, and he took up residence in the ruins in early uh, 2013. He was around for about two and a half, three months. And he'd be seen swimming in the uh, flooded old pools. He apparently made a nest inside one of the old uh, uh, pipes where he's poking his head out here. And then uh, he, he drew huge crowds. We had to put up barricades and safety railings and have people down there, you know, to keep the crowds at bay. And one day he just disappeared. Why? We think he was a young male and it just realized there were no young females and he went in search of greener pastures. People always ask when they give tours out there, has anyone seen Sutro Sam? Not for seven years, but we're waiting. A lot of things we, we don't know about Sutro baths. A lot of the records of the construction and the uh, drawings were destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. A lot of records do remain, but they're sort of a scattershot. And archaeologists have done surveys of the baths and the ruins trying to figure what features are which. In this case, I was part of a team. We went out to uh, document the old catch basin and the tunnels and the caves through Point Lobos through which water used to rush in to fill the baths. We waited till the lowest tide of the year and we had a safety team there. And uh, we went into the catch basin, taking measurements, taking photographs. We found things we didn't even know what they were. Uh, in this case, fellow standing there, his name's uh, John Hall. He's a historical architect. Uh, we have a mysterious pipe sticking out of a rock with no practical purpose on earth. But what John felt was, you know, just that nudge that I think there's something more. And I looked up at him in horror as he climbed around that rock face to your left, dangling over the air, and he had a camera in his left hand, and he reached around and he started snapping pictures in the blind of the other side of the rock face. And I'm standing there going, we're going to get in trouble. And yeah, he, uh, he came back, and uh, luckily, and this is what he got. The, this is the best of a bunch of shots. It's the upper corner of a bricked up doorway 
in the face of the cliff, 15 feet above the water with no access. What is it? What's behind that door? You know, there's still mysteries at Sutros. What was this place? So that's the quick overview. That's the history. Uh, so much more still to be, be learned. If you haven't been to Sutro Baths, go down, explore, just watch your step. If you haven't been to San Francisco, go west. Go to the edge of San Francisco. Go to the edge of America and uh, imagine what once was. So I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. And oh, yeah, one more thing. I want to send my thanks to all these folks who helped me do my research. Found out there are a lot of people that love sutros. I was just lucky to be the one that was able to get the story told. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, can I say something? I'm Jean Dower. Uh, John, this is unbelievable. We're riveted. Um, I swam there with my mom and my sister in the late 40s and early 50s. We did wear the wool, scratchy, itchy bathing suits. So they were still in. I don't know if they were mandatory. Also, I remember the waves crashing through the window in the big pool by the slide coming in from the ocean. And also there was inner tubes from airplanes in one of the pools that we would all yes. fight for. Yeah, you remember? Yes. Yes. I, and my but, the, it, the itchy swimming suits, they were still there. Um, they uh, You could bring your own swimsuit. And the way it was described to me was that if you didn't have your own suit or if you're one of those kids, I remember I was always the one on the bus, that you, know, you finally get to the swimming pool and you realize, I got my swimsuit. You know, they still had the old ones to pull out and you wore them. And everybody remembers how itchy they were and how, how much they weighed when they got wet. Yes, awful. Yes, awful. <laughs> Also, my grandparents came over from on the ferry from Sausalito dating at what they called the statuary. Statuary. Sutro statuary. So we have a lot of history in that uh, location. A lot okay, of people, a lot of people have a lot of memories of that place. You think of how many thousands of people went there and how long it was open. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was, thank, was riveting. Well, thank you. Any? Uh, so, uh, Helen, we got any questions? I haven't. Uh, no one has chatted any questions in here. You was so thorough and awesome. Um, <laughs> I just want to tell everyone I put a little link to John's PayPal in the chat if you're interested in offering him a gratuity on this fabulous tour of uh, Sutra Baths. Um, we're getting so many thank yous in the chat. That was amazing. And um, I have a question for you. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the movie? Is it the lineup or the? Um, I, is it the lineup? Yes, or, the lineup. Okay. Yes, it was uh, made in 1956, 57, and it was shot all over San Francisco. The same director that directed Dirty Harry, uh, Don Siegel. Did it, and it was called film noir, and a boy film, you know, uh, dark film. Boy, was it! Uh, it's about a uh, uh, bunch of criminals running around San Francisco trying to recover a shipment of drugs, and the drop-off place is Sutro Baths, and uh, they filmed in there uh, for several days. And there's a, a horrific scene where a guy in a wheelchair is thrown off one of the upper balconies and lands on top of the uh, of an ice skater in the ice skating rink below. This is this is 1957 and um, I interviewed George Whitney Jr., the son of the owner, years and years later and he said that did it. You know, we didn't allow any more movies or TV shows to be made at Sutras. We didn't want that reputation. Uh, if, if you if you ever see the movie come up the lineup um, watch it. It's an amazing period piece of San Francisco, and it's the only Hollywood movie I've ever seen that was made in the baths. Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube, actually, and if you go about an hour into it, I mean, the movie's great. I like it. I see it a couple times. Um, it's, that's when you see the Sutro, um, the last iteration of Sutro's. Um, they, they, they got it right, too. The, uh, the uh, uh, crowds of school kids running around, ice skaters, the uh, uh, the, the nonstop uh, 
music in the background coming from the old coin operated what are they called um orchestrions yeah wow all right Stephen has a question and where did the railroad start to get to the cliff house so where do they start ah uh, the train was called the ferries and cliff house and the innermost terminal was literally the site of the Jewish Community Center at Presidio Avenue and California Street. Uh, and uh, it ran out California Street to 33rd Avenue, and then it uh, turned right and it curved around the cliffs of Land's End. Uh, it didn't go to the ferry building, but because Sutro had uh, required a transfer system, you could get off of the steam train, walk across the, the street at uh, California Street, and get onto a cable car that got you to the ferry building. So for a nickel, you could get clear across town. Wow. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Kat, what was the name of the movie? The, the lineup is the name of the movie, correct? Yeah, the movie's called The Lineup. The Lineup. Um, when was uh, the Sutra Mansion torn down? There's a question from Lane Clifford. Up at Sutro Heights. Uh, eventually, the city of San Francisco purchased Sutro Heights from the estate, and uh, Emma's daughter, who was an elderly lady, she had a request that she be allowed uh, to live there as long as she wanted. I think it was any of the heirs that wanted to. And Emma died in 1938. Nobody else wanted to live in the old house, and it was torn down by the city in 1939. Wow. Wouldn't that be awesome to see that? I'll tell you, I would love to witness any of this with my own eyes. That's why I tell people now, save the memories that you have now, because 30, 40, 50 years from now, it's going to be a memory, and, and you too will have historic memories. Yes. Um, John? Uh, someone has a question? John, would... Um... When uh, Sufo was elected mayor, it was 1895, and you said he died in 1897. Was he still in office? Because I was told he had to be mayor. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that was kind of fuzzy. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, Sufo was elected mayor in 1895. You said that he had to be mayor, and you said he died in 1997. Was he still mayor? <laughs> No, he was elected in uh, the election of 1894, and he served. They only served two years in those days, so uh, he was out of office uh, by 1897. And he, he uh, somebody asked him how he enjoyed being mayor, and he is, uh, to paraphrase, he said he hated it. Um, he was used to uh, you know working with you know hard rock miners and. Uh, politicians in Washington, D.C., but he couldn't manage the Board of Supervisors. He had to the first years in the United States. Oops, sorry. We can answer that question. Ellen, I, I couldn't hear any of that. Okay, I'm going to ask him to, to chat it in the chat room so we can um, answer that question. Great, uh, yeah, please. Um, Kat was, what was the length of the heated pools? The length of the heated pools? Mm -hmm. I think they were uh, 45 feet long, and they, they, they weren't consistent in size. I think one was 45 by 30, and the others were like 45 by uh, uh, 20. They... Uh, the smallest pool was usually the one that was the warmest, and for many years that was reserved for women and children, no men. Wow. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, I've looked at thousands and thousands of uh, uh, images of San Francisco, and whenever I find ones of Sutro baths with the swimmers in them, I always look to see, you know, what is the crowd makeup? And men must have out outnumbered women by 20, 25 to one. And it was probably pretty daunting in the 1890s for a woman to go swimming with men, hence their own swimming pool. 
Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, is uh, um, a Kyla, Kyla Sutro, are you um, able to ask your question? Hello? Hi. Hello. Um, the question's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Hi, John. Um, I can't invite you all over, but I would really love if you would come in and have a dinner with my extended family and I. We are um, we're not direct descendants of Adolf, but we're uh, direct descendants of his brother, Leob. And um, we'd love to have you over for dinner. <laughs> we like talking about ourselves, and we have um, a lot of good memorabilia, and you would be most welcome. Well, if this ever ends and we're ever able to get out, I would love to, 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 to meet you guys. One of the most common questions that I get is, are there any sutros still around? There are, there are several. Um, there's Steven Sutro is an architect in San Francisco. Um, Ariel Sutro, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, there are, but not, uh, not all direct descendants. And I think we came over from Bavaria uh, before Adolf mm -hmm. uh, for our, for our line. And, um, yeah, we have we have a, the biggest piece of paper I ever saw was my family tree, and <laughs> they is certainly a, a big part of that. And yeah. um, I would like to I, go to Nevada and hang out in Sutra Hotel, and yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would, if, well, let's let's make contact cool. offline sure. and keep in touch. Great. I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll get you. Thank you. Or keep keep answering those great questions. Thank you so much. It was a very thorough, thorough very thorough presentation. Oh, thanks. Well, great Thank to you. have us on one of our presentations. Um, so, uh, Anita Rao, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. I'm muted. Hey. Hi, Jojo. Um, Hi, I, I just wanted to know if it was integrated. If it was integrated. Um, in later That's years, true. yes. It, like, it was, uh, like most of San Francisco, uh, it, it, there was unwritten discrimination. There was a very famous uh, lawsuit shortly after the baths opened where an African-American man wanted to go for a swim and he was denied admission. Uh, African-Americans were allowed at Sutro's to be spectators and uh, participate in everything but not go in the water. And uh, this fellow, uh, he wanted to go for a swim and he sued Sutro. It was a test case. Uh, testing a new law in California called the Dibble Law that said that public accommodations, you can't discriminate against African Americans. What would happen was, uh, you know, we, we, he won a Pyrrhic victory. He was granted uh, like $500 from the courts, but mm -hmm. he never got to go swimming. It just seems to be mm -hmm. one of those things where, okay, you win, we're not changing our policy. Um, and there are, it's not until the 19... Uh, late 40s i find photographs of people of color actually swimming in the pools so it's hard to find this stuff in writing that there was discrimination but i think it's fair to assume that there was so chinese definitely not um uh in that yeah there's there's pictures yeah. of uh, asian kids and black kids and white kids all you know having a great mm -hmm. time together but in terms of those big pictures of people in the old wool bathing suits and stuff like that it's a mm -hmm. it's a white crowd yeah and were there were there murals in that picture i thought i saw murals somewhere in one of your pictures in the uh, they had one painted mural on the side of one of the big concrete walls it mm -hmm. was a it was the big retaining wall of, of the diving tank and they had a mural of a beach scene uh, on mm -hmm. it that's that's the only one that i found okay thank you yeah. Oh, oh, I have a question. Yeah. John? Yes. I'm, here. I'm just curious. I'm curious. I have a recollection of a rope swing that was able to go out to the pool and drop off of a rope. Am I having hallucinations or was there a rope? I know that there were uh, rings, like uh, workout rings, where you could swing out. I would okay, doubt, and, and there were trapezes, so I wouldn't doubt if there was a rope swing too. Okay, just I just remember my brother 
trying to get me when I was in the water underneath by dropping off from one of those devices. So I think that's what is happening. Yeah, uh, in, the, in the pictures where the, the uh, pools are full of kids, it's like some things are timeless. You can see they're trying to jump on top of each other. They're uh, <laughs> trying to get down the slide five at a time. Um, yeah. They're splashing water on each other. So yes, uh, dropping in on your uh, sister from a rope sounds totally normal. Well, it was a lot better than feeling the itch of the black bathing suit. Just have something <laughs> else to think of. And thanks for talking about those tires. I wondered where they got tires that big. Of course, uh, airplane tires. Yep, that's it. Well, thank you so much. It was absolutely wonderful. I feel like a uh, young person having gone through it already today. Uh, thanks for the compliment. Thank you, Janice. Um, Ellen Delara is not able to uh, ask this question herself, but um, she wanted to know um, if the Sutra fa family donated any of the land or was it all purchased by the city? Um, I believe there was some land donated around Land's End. They owned all the land up the cliffs below the... Uh, that's now Lincoln Park Golf Course. Um, I'm going to hedge my bets here because I, I know that there some land was given to the city. Most of it was sold. Uh, there was. The, I'm not going to go any further. I don't want to make a fool of myself. But uh, yeah, the, the sutras were generous, but they were they were also selling property. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, Kat, if you want to unmute and ask your question, or I can ask it for you. Well, I'll just ask. Uh, Kat, go ahead. You want to ask? Yes, I was wondering if the arsonist was ever found and convicted. No, they. Uh, he was. Let, yes and no. He was found. He was the watchman who was on the project, and he had. He was a young guy, and he had previously, as a twelve-year-old, uh, set fire to his high school or junior high in San Francisco. So he had a history of arson. Uh, which was probably not known to the uh, demolition company that hired him. You know, if they, they seal your juvenile records. Well, the guy was troubled his whole life. And uh, the day of the fire, he was found uh, running through the bushes outside, sweating profusely, uh, making up various stories to the police that arrived. As they put it together later and they were able to figure out who this guy was, um, even though his records were sealed, he was definitely known to the fire department. Um, uh, the people that I talked to who remembered those days and who have had access to the file say it's it's a 99% lock, it was him. The only way you can really get a prosecution, though, and a conviction in arson is if the person cops to it or if someone is an eyewitness to it. Uh, it's very hard to prove. And the guy uh, maintained till the day he died he'd been framed and uh, and that he'd never even you know, it, he knew nothing about the fire at his junior high school. So they couldn't convict him, but they sure knew who he was. He was actually interviewed by a, a, um, an arson inspector uh, about uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it was like a cold case and somebody just took it on themselves to, to follow up on it. And they went to his house and they interviewed him and said he was a real nasty piece of work. He was uh, he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't going to admit to nothing. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Lane Clifford, if you want to unmute and ask your question. See you there? Well, I'll decide. Lane wants to know, uh, did the purchase, uh, did they purchase the land where the Sutra Heights mansion was located? No, the uh, Sutro estate made a deal with the city of San Francisco that Sutro Heights Park would become a city park uh, there was the city purchased it, and then Emma. This was Emma Sutro asked if she could keep living there, and after she passed away and the house was torn down, it was all city park. The big agreement was that a it be city park forever, and b it be called Sutro Heights forever. So uh, when the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which includes all the open space around San Francisco, Marin, Marin Headlands, 
when they purchased uh, Sutro bath site, they also purchased the Cliff House. Adjacent to that city park land included Ocean Beach and Land's End and Sutro Heights. The city transferred those to the National Park Service. Didn't we didn't long way saying we didn't pay to purchase uh, Sutro Heights. It was transferred by the uh, city park and rec. Oh, wow. Yeah, there were a lot of areas in San Francisco that uh, we now think of as you know federally maintained were city parks, uh, Fort Funston, Ocean Beach, uh, Land's End, uh, Aquatic Park. And uh, the city of San Francisco was, frankly, in the 1970s, very happy to transfer those to the feds because it would get them off of their books, yet they'd still be maintained as open space. Uh, Lane wants to know what year that um, that happened with the, the Sutro stuff. Oh, Sutro Heights? I believe I'm digging here, but I believe it uh, it came over to us in 1977 because I was working at park headquarters and they sent me out there uh, with because I knew how to operate a camera, which actually took some skill in those days. They sent me out there to photo document um, uh, Sutro Heights and uh, Fort Funston and a couple of other places so that we'd have some uh, documentation of existing conditions. Oh wow. It's beautiful. I love going up there and see it. Uh, Blaine said, my grandfather worked for the SF Rec and Parks. We call it Grandpa's Park. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, the, 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 the groundskeepers up there, they've always been really dedicated to that site. Wow. I wonder if he was, wonder if he was the old gardener that I knew uh, at, at, when the city was transferring over. I remember some an old gardener showing me around, and grumbling about how kids were always coming in and busting up statuary. I don't know, but he said his name was Ike Jones. That's a great name, Ike Jones. Right there, yeah. <laughs> uh, so if anybody else has any more questions, feel free to unmute and ask John while we have him here for a few more minutes. Uh, we also have John Juster, Joan Juster wrote, she, we got married in Sutro Heights Park in 1980. Oh, I, I, I did too, my first time. Are you <laughs> it, it, I, I hope his was more successful. <laughs> we got married in the little white gazebo up there. Wow. It's got to be one of the most popular marriage sites in the park. And you, do you can you get a permit to do it there? To, or is it? Uh, you, yeah, you, you, you need to get a permit, uh, and they'll they'll ask for a, a deposit, uh, and a, there'll be a fee. Um, because I worked for the park, uh, they kind of waived some of that stuff, and that was a little bit more loosey goosey in those days. But yeah, you can get a, you can get a permit to get married there. Uh, the commercial photography, I, I've seen bar mitzvahs, so yeah, it's it's a great place. It is a, it's a it is a beautiful place. So, um, so well, anyone else have any uh, any questions? Any other questions? Uh, well, Joan said she got married under the elephant tree and the permit was $75. So there oh, you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I am just going to put this little here in your the chat again. Um, John, I can't thank you enough. It was such an amazing uh, presentation. I just, um, I'm sure everyone, the, the chat we are getting is just how much everyone's learned so much. What an awesome presentation. More and more and more. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want to thank you from the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild for doing such a great presentation and always um, uh, doing some um, great stuff for us. And um, uh, I just want to let people know we'll be sending out a little email tomorrow just as a thank you and giving you some more information on John and his website. And um, I look forward to seeing you again uh, next month for another presentation. Um, and is there anything else you want to share? Moi? Yeah, you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I I wish I could do this in front of all of you in a room so so we could I could uh, see if my jokes landed. <laughs> I, you, you do. I know. I, yeah. Well, I think we need to be on camera more so we can be like, yeah. But no, yeah. it was great. You and, got, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to do these. 
it, this being in isolation, the hardest thing for me has been not getting out and doing walks and talks. And and uh, e even though it's virtual, it's so good to see and talk with everybody. Exactly. Yes, it's the new normal. So we're going to take what we can get. But by the way, we're getting comments that we're all laughing and your jokes are good. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, and if anybody has any more questions or follow up, uh, you can drop me a line. My uh, email link is uh, right there on my uh, on my web page. I'm always happy to share information. Yeah, and I also want to say that you can, uh, on John's website, you can always grab one of his suture books with all these awesome uh, pictures in it. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, someone wrote here, as expected, John is, is a truly unique pre pre presenter, and I, I tr says John is a truly unique presenter, and I have to agree, uh, always, I never miss with you coming on and giving a presentation, and from someone that is a transplant from Baltimore, Maryland to San Francisco, and a true lover of San Francisco's history, I still think you are the rock star historian of San Francisco. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Family. But none of them, uh, well, you know, I'm glad you got to go. At least you did. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That's, wonderful. That's great. Um, yeah. I, I, there seems that there's a lot of San Franciscans that are members of the Tour Guide Guild. Yeah, there is. There is. There are. Um, most of them, though, are not first generation or, you know, from Italy. They're second, first, second, third. Yeah. 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 I think I'm, I'm fourth, I think. So that's, that's good car stretched out there yeah one of the other founders was um he passed away many years ago but he was uh mauricio del toso mm -hmm. and mauricio um 